In academia, I have found it easier to come out as a lesbian than an equestrian. <laughs> lesbian, at least in arts and humanities circles in the last 30 years, is politically cool. It's subversive. It's from the margins. Its stories are ones of coming up from oppression, or as feminist scholars so usefully remind us, up from interlocking oppressions <laughs> of race, class, gender, and sexuality. Many of the leading theorists in theater and performance studies write from an avowedly lesbian position. Lesbian has considerable academic cachet. <laughs> Equestrian, on the other hand, <laughs> mobilizes quite a different set of assumptions, especially when it's tied, as it is in my case, to being born and raised into a family that bred, raced, and showed thoroughbred horses. For me, Coming out as an equestrian means owning up to being raised with a lot of money, gained through the very kind of capitalist wheeling and dealing that our Marxist-inflected professions of theater and performance studies have been bent on critiquing, and it means owning up to my family's WASP cultural aspirations and preoccupation with displays of anglophilic blue-bloodedness that go along with that economic upward mobility. These are uncomfortable subjects. <laughs> Not just because they're politically outré, but because they magnify that fear that many academics harbor, that we will be found out, exposed as frauds who don't really know what we're talking about and aren't as smart as we seem. <laughs> when you grow up with the kind of wealth and privilege that can afford thoroughbred horses, the specter of doubt that you really earned your accomplishments can grin most ghoulishly from among the skeletons in the closet. So even though these expensive, form-fitting English riding clothes are in many ways my native garb, <laughs> I actually feel quite naked standing up here wearing them in an academic setting. Now, if I were really being true to my Anglophile blue-blooded roots, I would have the good taste not to mention these topics at all. <laughs> For I was always raised with the dictum that it was crass to talk about money, even though one's entire lifestyle exuded it. But then again, I'm half Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and people on that side of the family will talk about anything. Money, sex, food, bowel status. More to the point, I raise these issues because lesbian and equestrian, while in many ways at opposite poles in terms of academic and political cachet, are actually dynamically interconnected. In performance history, as I'm discovering with increasing intrigue and in my personal experience. Hearing of my mother's struggles to get me out of the barn and into a dress, her society friends would invoke that Freudian saw, oh, don't worry, dear, she'll outgrow horses and turn to boys. Well, it didn't quite work out that way for me, partly because my mother herself didn't follow that script, and neither, it turns out, did generations of women before or since. So as a lesbian academic, now trained, or at least practiced in queer studies and feminist historiography, who still rides a thoroughbred horse, albeit on a much reduced scale from what I used to do, I'm looking back at my years of equestrian training and experience and finding a rich resource for historical research. That's the connotation of my title today, Horseback Views, Views Literally and Figuratively from the Saddle.
and back through horses into my own past and the wider Anglo-American equestrian tradition. What has been an avocation for me, a recreation separate from my professional life as a scholar, has now moved to the center as the source of my hippology, or horse science, from the Greek hippo, meaning horse. I'm writing a book on the subject, fashioning the thoroughbred ideal about women and horses performing on various social and theatrical stages, mainly in New York from 1865 to 1930. When people think about horses and American culture, if they think about horses at all, they tend to think of the West and the cowboy tradition. Part of the intervention I want to make is that Eastern English-style riding and English-derived horses, namely thoroughbreds, also had a profound impact in shaping dominant American culture, especially, I want to argue, where women are concerned. It's in those decades following the Civil War that white, middle, and upper-class women start entering the sport of riding in large numbers. By the 1880s, those numbers are large enough. Indeed, horseback riding has become the favorite female exercise amid a burgeoning physical culture movement that we see the publication of the first equestrian manual by and for American women. This was The American Horsewoman by Elizabeth Platt Carr. Now, Carr was a staunch advocate of the English model of mothers lovingly, though exactingly, handing on the arts of riding to their daughters. Noting, and this is quoting Carr, that when a lady is mounted on a well-trained and spirited horse, each look, each motion, awakes a newborn grace. as well as promotes physical health and a sense of confidence and boldness about going forward into the world. Those first generations of women who took up riding in large numbers, those were the generations who mothered the turn of the century generations who entered college and the professions in large numbers and successfully advocated for suffrage. I want to know what horses and riding did for those women in order to understand the operations of equestrianism as a historical force shaping their lives and actions. In those decades of rising immigration from southern and eastern Europe around the turn of the last century, amid increasing racism and xenophobia, the thoroughbred was the saddle horse of choice as the bourgeoisie strove to perform its Anglo-Americanness. And women proved to be especially well-suited to this breed, which is why that particular human-equine relationship is keenly at issue here. On stage with me are a number of objects that bear echoes of my history with thoroughbreds. And not just echoes, but material traces of bodies in action. A key property of leather is that it absorbs skin oils and sweat. It stretches and gives with use. Leather horse riding equipment needs to be broken in. It gains value with age. This is the girth that goes around my horse's belly to hold the saddle in place. This needs to be cleaned after every time I use it. And over the years, it's acquired this gorgeous patina from sweat and saddle soap. It feels and smells Wonderful. I'm going to pass it around. <laughs> so you all get just a little bit of that sensation <laughs> of fine, horse-worn leather. <laughs> the 
This bridle and that saddle are decades old. They came to me from my mother, and they bear the imprint of our communion with the numerous horses that graced our lives. Sitting in that saddle, taking up the reins, and assuming the position to ride, there's an intense feeling of familiarity, a profound sense of coming home, and of connecting with something that's very here and now, but also very old. Notably absent up here with me is the living horse itself. Although I must say that facsimile works quite well when technical circumstances allow me to use it. As amazing as it would be to have a real horse up here, I want to use its absence to query the historiographical absence that my project addresses. Horses were replete in American culture until 1900. But most historians who aren't horse people, which is most historians, look right past them, perhaps dismissing them as part of the background. My point is, they carried people into the foreground, women into the foreground, and enduringly and transformatively marked their lives. So absent the physical animal, we want to conjure it imaginatively and look at some of the traces it left in the print, and pictorial records. <laughs> in this equipment, and in me. 